particularly in the pet food industry, there has been for too long uh, and too deep a, a lack of trust. But I, I find that in order to overcome that, the best way is to, to seek more transparency. So hi there, food enthusiasts. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, to Future Food Guests, where thought leaders in today's food industry discusses the, the trends in technology that will shape the future of food. My name is Sachin Sharma, and today we are speaking with Gerardo Perez from Fresh Pet. Uh, Gerardo Perez, uh, thanks for spending time with us today. How are you doing today? I am very well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Awesome, great. So, Gerardo, uh, it's, it's great to have you here on the show. Would you mind sharing with us and our guest, uh, you know, some information about the Fresh Pet products, technologies, your role, and any other information or context you think might be relevant to our listeners, you know, uh, because our listeners certainly wants to know more about, you know, how they can reach out to you, you know, the, your social media channels, if, if anything you wanted to just highlight here. Well, um, I work for Fresh Pet, which is a, a modern pet food company. And in, in my career, I have spent 24 years prior to coming to Fresh Pet working in other pet food industry companies. And I have worked for uh, companies that make dry pet food and, and canned foods, which are more traditional. Um, three years ago, I chose to come to this type of company because it's um, more innovative from my perspective. And I am an R&D guy. What gets me excited is, you know, developing new things and, and what is possible. And I think that even if you are not familiar with pet food, so you don't have a pet, you know that the more traditional type of pet food is dry kibble. And also you are probably familiar with canned pet food. This um, company, Fresh Pet, is specialized in fresh. Um, so the product is not subject to high temperatures. The product does not have um, any preservatives. So the only way to keep that through the chain safe for the consumption is to refrigerate it. So the only way you are going to have access to it is if you go to a specialized channel or any uh, main supermarket chain and you buy it from the chiller, from the refrigerator. Or now you can also get it directly to, to your home through Chewies. The product itself is different because it has got a higher meat content is um, is really liked by the dogs. It has um, different organoleptical properties. You can you can smell the ingredients, and you can also probably you don't want to eat pet food. I don't blame you for that. But if you press it, you can see it. This is it has got the, the texture of the meat. It has got the bounciness of the meat, and it's also having. The, the composition and even the moisture levels of the meat. So it's around 65% moisture, uh, more or less the same composition that the meat has and the same composition that um, the, the original chicken also has. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Thanks uh, for that soundbite. Uh, so in terms of your customer base, uh, are your customers uh, only United States or international customers? How's your business? Is it B2B or B2C business? Well, the, the business is international. We, we manufacture only in the US, but we export to Canada and also to the UK. And now we are also in Germany and in the Netherlands, expanding in Europe, also in France. It, it does require a, a network of chillers. So it's, it's somehow um, more... Um, I would say complicated from a logistics perspective than traditional pet foods, which are more self-stable and you can keep on the cell for one or two years, probably. Uh, okay, so um, I imagine your role as a marketing executive, you know, you, you follow, I'm, I'm sorry, you're not marketing executive, you are more on the R&D side of the fence. You follow news about the food and back, you know, in, you know, some of the tech technology and the trends. Which trend is of the most interest to you and to your organization, and why? Well, um, in, in pet foods, there is a 
a cascade of trends from human foods. And um, what we are seeing is that um, fresh pet is being very successful, is growing very fast, around 30% year on year. But I think that idea is, is a good idea if it is also produced at the right time. And I think the current trends are making this idea for in a more fertile ground, because what is happening is that I would say two main things. First, people are much more conscious of the importance of healthy food and the role in, it plays in their lives and in, in their longevity and their health and then what, what they can do. And they are much more health conscious. They are more um, uh, curious about the sourcing the, of their ingredients, their process. They are more keen to, to try to uh, be healthy. And the second important trend is that there is what we call a humanization of pets in which many people now uh, consider the pet um, part of the family. And, and maybe 20, 30 years ago, only 50, 60% of people would say the pet is part of the family and the dog is a dog. Now 95% of people say the, the pet is part of the family and is not only part of the family, it's, it's a sleeping in, in, in the bedroom, it's a sleeping in the bed with them. And sometimes they feel the pets have got more rights than other members of the family. When you combine these two trends, it means that what is good for me is good for my family and my dog is part of that family. So that extrapolation, that cascade down from human concerns to, to the pet means that um, it's, a, it's a very good moment for fresh pet. Interesting, thank you for that. Uh, so my next follow-up question on that one is, uh, you know, if, if you could see the future of, you know, the, the pet food industry, and based on what we know today, what, what do you think is the future like, you know, uh, of this industry? What are some of the challenges you see, and uh, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the internal challenges that you as an organization is working on, or the pet food industry is working on right now? Well, I think that the 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 pet food industry is evolving. It's evolving fast. Uh, obviously, every industry at the moment have got the challenges that are the result of COVID, but. Other putting that aside, I think that when uh, an industry has got uh, new players or new formats or new forms in the market, there is a bit of a kind of rearrangement of, of the market shares and there is an evolution. So with these new forms of, of pet foods, fresh pet foods, I am not saying that they are going to actually um, replace all the previous pet foods. Dry and canned will, of course, still be there. It's not going to be like when we all had Blackberries and suddenly the iPhone came and we all went like, I don't want the Blackberry, I want the new thing kind of. So I think that the dry and the can formats will still be there. They provide a lot of convenience and there are people very happy using them. But I think that we see an increasing trend of people redirecting their concept of what is right and what, what is the best for my pet. And that concerns are leading them to search and experiment and try new things. Many people begin to cook for their own pet and um, that's fine, but in the long term, they have concerns of, am um, I getting all the vitamins in the diet? And the truth is, am I also investing too much time in, in cooking for the pet and I am better off trying something that I can pick up from the self. Interesting. And Grado, one of the things uh, that we have been seeing and, you know, we have been listening from the other, uh, you know, leaders in the food industry is uh, there is some sort of a deficit of trust. You know, uh, the consumers are feeling that, you know, whatever is shown on the packaging, you know, that there's always that deficit in there. So, you know, for, for the fresh for the food, uh, the, the pet food industry, what are you, you know, doing to kind of regain that trust? I mean, is, is there any initiative you're working on to kind of make sure that that trust is strong, you know, for the consumers? I, I think that's a great question. And, and, and we have to be honest and, and humble. And, and you are right, particularly in the pet food industry, there has been a, a, a for too long and, and too deep a, a lack of trust. And, and I am not going to say whose fault it is or 
th there is always a, 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 a series of circumstances that cause that, that distrust. It's not just one event. But I, I find that in order to overcome that, the best way for that trust that, that you want to, to build with your clients, with your consumers, um, the best way is to, to seek more transparency. And, and the thing is, when I sit at the table and I look at my dinner, I want to be able to tell what that dinner is made of. I don't want to have to pick up a pack of dry pet food and have to turn it around and go down the list of ingredients. Many of them I do not understand or do not recognize to try to find out what am I putting on the bowl. Our um, focus when we develop new pet foods now at Fresh Pet is to make every ingredient visible and their proportions as well visible. So when the pet owner pours that food onto the bowl, he can say, okay, that's, that's a piece of chicken, that's a piece of beef, that's an egg, that's, that's carrot, that's a pea. And, and, and the pea and the carrot are actually a pea and a carrot. They are not something that has been extruded into a shape and color so that it looks like a carrot because at the end of the day, um, the, the consumer is, is not dumb. They, they know what they are buying and they know what they see. And I think that that the only way to build that trust is with a lot of work and with a lot of perseverance. Trust, uh, I always say trust is like a, like a beautiful glass. Um, it takes a lot of knowledge and effort to make it, but just one crack will make the whole thing disappear. And you only need one crack and the whole work is ruined. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, Gerardio, I just wanna shift your attention towards uh, another topic, which is the supply chain. And, uh, you know, we, we keep hearing, with, especially with the pandemic and we're still in the pandemic and, you know, labor shortage is another thing. How are you seeing as the, you know, the, the supply chain uh, transformation, you know, during this time or post COVID, you know, post pandemic, how, how are you seeing this, this whole, you know, industry, the supply chain field kind of revolution, you know, kind of having a revolution? Well, if I am honest with you, the current supply chain is a source of paranoia for me because when, when there are three or four days with nothing going wrong, I am beginning to get worried to say, thinking, oh my God, the big one is coming. There, there is a continuous, um, domino effect of we cannot get drivers or we cannot get meat or we cannot get organic chicken or we cannot get carrots or we cannot get a fiber source. Even then, now that we are expanding and we are building a new factory, now there is a shortage of isolation for the roof. So they are rationing that so we can only build so fast. And, and it's a, a kind of saying, okay, what, what else is coming wrong because something will go wrong. But in the longer term, hopefully we will, one day we will put all this behind us and things will go back to normal as everybody says. I think that the new future looks more like, if you want to grow, you need to grow with partners. You need to grow with farmers that understand what type of chicken and what type of animal welfare and what type of claims you depend on for that chicken. And you kind of grow together. It's like when, when we, you know, some of the biggest friendships I have in my life is the friends I used to play soccer with when I was a kid, and we have grown together, and we are in different continents, but with today's technology, our, our shared experience have made us bond so strongly. And we have partners that we have been working for the last 10 years, and we have grown together. I think that that's goes back to the building of trust and to the building of understanding and what expectations you have from each other. And, and we need that type of relationship because when, when you are cooking fresh and we are using chicken, for example, we only have five days from the day the chicken is running around to the day the chicken is in our back. You have such a strong interdependence that you cannot think like we are two different companies, you versus me. You have to think we, we, we are in this together. And you know, if, if one, if the boat sinks, we, we both get wet. So let's row together. Good point. Thanks for that information. 
And yeah, very well said, you know, uh, I, I really like your uh, point of view on, on the trust aspect of it. And, and from there, I just want to pivot towards the, the technology aspect of it. You know, how are you leveraging technology to meet uh, some of these challenges, you know, day-to-day -day challenges and, um, uh, you know, how traceability, you know, is, is traceability an issue for you? Kind of traceability of food, you know, provenance of the food. How is it moving from one, you know, one place to another? Uh, you know, are, are you as an organization uh, kind of talking that, talking about that, you know, in, in a conference room or that is something that you are really uh, looking forward to? We, we, we not only look forward to that, but we depend on that. Most of our claims, um, if you look at our packs, are non-GMO, uh, local sourced, uh, made in the USA. All those things depend on traceability. And in the ability to demonstrate that what you put on the, on the label is what you actually do. And, and that you do it regularly and, and consistently. And, and you can, um, with the snap of your fingers, produce the, the proof. So it, it, it is a, a new way of working. And uh, without that technology, um, I, I think that we, we wouldn't be able to continue to develop the products and, and the expectations that we, we currently are proposing. Thank you. Uh, now, you know, since you work in the R&D department, uh, I don't know, you may be in touch with the, with the marketing department and you may be, you know, having some sort of a statistics or uh, kind of visibility as to what consumers are, uh, you know, talking about and discussing and what are they interested in? Are there anything that, you know, you find really fascinating about the, about the consumers, their behaviors and, you know, what, what they are expecting uh, from the products, from your products, and you know, you want to do kind of highlight that. Anything yeah. you can trust? Yeah, I, I I feel very lucky to work with our current uh, marketing department because they are they are truly tuning into innovation and they are really learning and investigating and sharing those uh, insights with us to develop the right products and how the the generations from boomers to Gen X to millennials to Gen Senials how their expectations are changing. And although the younger generations are still maybe not representing the majority of the pet owners, eventually they will. And, and they, they have, um, I feel it's fascinating um, the fact that they, they have very different expectations. And for example, when, when I was growing up, I didn't have access to a computer until I was 20, to be honest, because they, they didn't exist. Uh, and, and now th the new generations cannot imagine life without a computer. It's like if we come from a different planet to them. Not only that, they are also concerned about the fact that they are inheriting a planet that has been abused, that, that, that you know, it is depressing looking at the news. Um, and, and you have the global warming and you have the fires and all these things. And they think we, we are inheriting a mess. Um, it, it's, it's, it's up to us to survive in, in this planet. We don't have another one. We have to do something. And, and they are actually putting that as a top priority for, priority for their decisions and, and their purchases. And, and so they should. So for us to be able to demonstrate, a, we have got a, a, a true dedication to pets, to people and to planet, and to the use of sustainable energy. And we, we are, focusing on carbon footprint, you have to show that you have that commitment and you have to walk the talk. It cannot be a marketing gimmick. It cannot be a pretend. Uh, it needs to be felt inside and to be genuine. And, and I notice it in, in the people I am recruiting, the new generations that they just come out of university. I mean, I have somebody in, in, in my team who, um, my team were kind of joking with her uh, because she, she had never used a can opener. And, and she is the type of person who, I mean, I, uh, my wife and I, we grow our own eggs. We have our own chickens. And she says, I, want, I don't want those chickens. I want to, to buy from you. And, and you see it in them that they have such a conviction, such a belief, such a... Um, 
unquestionable ethics that you think they, they are going to change the world and, and we better follow them because they, they come in, they are pushing hard. Um, and, and I think that's refreshing. It, 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 it means working for a company like FreshPet, it means that we are in the right spot at the right time and, and makes the future very, very exciting. Interesting, yeah. Well said. Um, I, I certainly see that the the new generation is really up to speed. They they are like technologically advanced generation at this point. You know, it's they see things you know from a from a technology not not very old school. And and with that, I just wanted to understand you know the technology um, aspect of uh, your organization. Um, I know one of the big thing in the organization is the acceptance of the technology, right? I mean, uh, big enterprises, organizations wanted to implement new technologies, uh, which in some cases becomes, you know, for, for some of the generations, some of the millennials, it becomes really a, a, a very tough task. You know, they always see like, oh my gosh, the, you know, the, uh, they, they see a threat to their jobs and, you know, they, they, they see that this change is uh, kind of going to bring them uh, uh, you know, it's going to face difficulty, you know, so how, you know, for, for any new technological implementations or any, uh, any innovation that you do within your uh, organization, how is the acceptance within, within the workforce that you have, um, you know, you might be running some sort of surveys and you know, internal surveys as to like uh, how, you know, acceptable, you know, the, those new technologies are for them, you know, so how, how do you see that? I, 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 I'm glad you asked me that because that's one of the reasons why I left a very comfortable role in a very good company, um, which I was happy with to, to do innovation in this company. Because in my previous life making pet foods, I am very proud of what I have done and we have developed great products together. But every new idea I had, I either had to put it into the extruder technology and make it into a keyboard onto a can technology and kind of boil it for, for five hours. And that was limiting what uh, some of the things I wanted to do. Now that I work for FreshPet, literally every time I go home and I open the fridge, I, I look at this and, and I look at that and, ooh, I could put that with that and maybe with a bit of the other, it could be complete and balanced for cats and dogs and it would be palatable and we, we could, and I bring it into the office and, we start, we have a, a bench top lab, like, that, like a small kitchen, and we have a pilot plan, and we start cooking, and we start testing things, and, and then we, we try it ourselves, and, and we think it's good. Then we try it with the real experts, which are the cats and the dogs, and, and they will be the ones that actually put the thumb up or the thumb down. But the fact that you are a small company and, and you haven't created a massive monster of of building capacity means that you are more flexible in what kind of uh, process, cooking, um, um, drying, um, you know, different ways of doing things because the future is to be built. You are not restrained by the fact that you have already committed so much capital to one technology. So what we are trying to do now is to look more into the new uh, factories of the future rather than being designed just to be able to produce the same product in big volumes, we are designing them to be flexible and try to make pet food be more like human food in which the ingredients are combined and, and at the end in a safe way, and you can actually see all the ingredients on the bowl rather than the ingredients are all grinded together at the beginning and then pressed all together. But um, although that gives you a, a more, I would say, efficient process, you end up with a kind of ground brown stuff that you don't know what it is. And that's what we want to avoid. So um, being the uh, kind of crazy guy in, in R&D, that's, that's, that's what make, the type of job that, that makes us happy, the type of thing that makes you jump out of the bed, um, because you know that you are not so restrained by by one kind of traditional process. And the, the limit is, is the imagination. Thank you. Uh, so, so we have talked a lot about, you know, the, the food industry and, you know, pet food industry, what, what things that we are doing. Now let's put your consumer hat on. Uh, 
By the way, do you have pets? Yes, I, I, my wife and I, we have a Pinocchio, our dog. We have two cats, horses, chickens, geese, and ducks. So every time we move, it's like moving a, a circus rather than moving a family. So, so you know, as, a, as a you know pet pet owner and you know um, you know the consumer of the you know the pet food, what is important to you when it comes to the you know the 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 food for the pets? You know, what what are the things that are important for you when you just go and select that food? What what I do is um, I, I love to observe the reaction of the pet, and we we I think that. I couldn't live without pets. I, 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 my wife and I, we really love them. And maybe we, we don't have kids, but we treat them like kids. But when I offer something new, I just observe them. And, and they cannot talk, but that doesn't mean that they cannot communicate. They do let you know what they like and what they don't like and what they find strange and what they, they say, oh, I want more of that. If you are tuning to their behaviors, and I think that every involved pet owner is, they immediately know what their cat or their dog likes. The, the same that a parent knows what the baby likes and doesn't. If, if you are trying to put a little spoon into that little mouth and, and the baby is turning the head around trying to avoid it, you know it doesn't like it. Well, the pets is not like that, but the, the way they eat it, the way they look at you, the, the excitement when you are preparing the food, um, their um, basically um, the human animal bond that you develop with them um, is is crucial and and people say i have heard from from some pet owners that giving them food is a, is giving them love and 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 the food is the vehicle to say i love you so that that is um something that i find is satisfying that's something that uh i i love animal behavior uh, i i think that there is pleasure in, in doing that and that moment in which you are preparing the food for your dog or for your cat. And, and, and we have look at how people pre present pet food. And um, if, if you are presenting dry, you just put it on the bowl and put it on the floor. And, but, but now that I am feeding my pets from the fridge, their, their excitement before the feeding, the pre-feeding behaviors is so much uh, rich. Um, the way they circle, the will, the jab, the way they 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 salivate sometimes, and um, the excitement that feeding time when you are cutting the food, and it might be less convenient, it might be more laborious because if you get a roll of fresh, but you have to kind of chop it, but you begin to say, oh, this one has carrots and this one has has peas, and and yesterday I gave you the beef, today you are going to have the turkey. Those ten minutes of interaction are when you have. The most undevoted attention from the pets. Um, those 10 minutes of interaction, I think, summarize the whole concept of pet ownership and, and human animal bond. You, you do not have a pet because it's beautiful. You, you, you have a plant because it's beautiful, but you have a pet, even if it is not beautiful, uh, even if it is not perfect, um, because you have that relationship, that bond, that, that communication. And, and I can tell you those 10 minutes of, of, of preparing the food and putting it onto the bowl, um, they, they create many giggles, many smiles, um, many kind of um, satisfaction of, of pride of, of being a good pet owner. Good point. I mean, I, I cannot much believe in that because uh, I'm not a very current uh, pet owner. I, I used to have pet like, like 15 years ago, uh, but my kids, uh, you know, they, they are really, they are free. They wanted to have a pet, uh, but because of, you know, uh, because of the kind of job that we are into, it becomes very difficult to kind of take care of a pet, but that's something on, that's on my list to kind of, you know, own a pet. Um, so one, one other thing is that, you know, I, I have a friend of mine and, uh, you know, they, they got a new pet and the thing is they are vegetarians. They are vegetarians and they, in their life, they never actually ate food. Uh, you know, they never eat uh, non-vegetarian or, or meat. So for them, you know, uh, keeping a pet was a challenge initially because they were like, oh my gosh, you know, we never eat meat and how are we going to prepare ourselves, you know, eggs or, or meat for them? So, uh, you know, they, they moved a lot towards the plant-based options or the meat-free uh, food options. 
what uh, pet, you know, fresh pet uh, food is doing, you know, in terms of moving into that horizon. Do you do you see uh, that there is uh, there's a significant population uh, who wants to, uh, you know, feed their dogs, you know, less uh, meat or maybe, you know, no meat for that matter. And, uh, you know, like plant based is another thing. How, how do you see that whole market? Uh, we, we have just launched a plant based product. It's called a spring and a sprout and it still needs to be refrigerated. The, the main thing is it's more challenging to develop a diet for cats and dogs um, than for people uh, because uh, from the perspective of the nutrition, because we can share what we eat every change, what we eat every day, and we end up with a balanced diet, more or less. Cats and dogs only eat what we put on the bowl, so they depend on us. And, and you have to keep in mind that dogs need more protein, probably double than we do, and cats nearly three times as much as we do. So you really need to have a good nutritionist and a good veterinarian to develop products that are plant-based for cats and dogs. And the way to, we found that the way to do it is we, we have developed a diet that is plant-based, but is not vegan. It does contain some egg. And the issue when you develop plant-based diets for cats and dogs is that cats and dogs have very high requirements of sulfur containing amino acids methionine and cysteine. So what we have done to provide that is, A, we are providing a bit of egg and, and it's a scramble egg that you can see it on the product. And egg is very rich in these sulfur containing amino acids. And also what we have done is get proteins from different plants, from different plant kingdoms, let's say. And, and, and we have used proteins that come from grains like cereals like oats, and we have used proteins that also come from other types of plants like peas and soy. And when you combine these two different protein sources, they complement each other and they provide an amino acid balance that is closer to the needs of the pet. So with that, and with the addition of A, we have found that we got a very good product that is also palatable because if, if the dogs and the cats don't eat it, then you might put as much nutrition as you want in it, but it's not going to do anything. And just to make sure that the cats and dogs, um, the, the dogs were um, okay being fed that product, we fed a group of dogs for six months exclusively on that spring and sprout product we just launched. And they have done very well. At the end of the study, we asked a veterinary clinician to examine them, to check their health, to check their uh, heart parameters, and, and they all passed with flying colors and they were maintaining body weight. So it's, it's only when we got that kind of um, data that we felt it was fair and, and we, we felt very proud of the product and we have, we have launched it because with, with making pet foods, is, there is a big responsibility. And you, you know that the cats and dogs will only feed on that product. And if you forget anything, something is missing or is in the wrong proportions, and there are 40 different nutrients that animals in, uh, need, cats and dogs, you, you can really make that animal very, very sick. And, and we don't want to do that. So um, that's uh, a, a great question from you. And, and I think that the new generations are more uh, environmentally um, savvy and concerned and responsible, and they are demanding that type of products. Maybe not to feed the dog only plant-based products every day of his life, but maybe have a meat-free Fridays, for example, which I also do in my house. Interesting stuff. Thanks. Uh, now let's let's move on to the the packaging aspect of it. You know. Uh, in today's world, you know, we, we are kind of moving towards the the plastic-free kind of packaging or disposable packaging or, uh, you know, so what, what are you doing in the packaging space to, you know, package some of your uh, products and how do you see, uh, you know, that, that thing um, in, in the future, you know, innovation into the packaging in the future? That, that's also a great question. Um, I have just dedicated somebody from my team to explore that 
And we do use plastic in our products. And some of the challenges is that that product is fresh. It has high moisture content. So you cannot put it in a paper bag, for example, that, that, that wouldn't work out. And that product also needs to survive in a fridge and, and, and to look good. We, we are looking into new types of products um, uh, that provide packaging with some percentage of recyclable material. So th there are two options. You can, you can make your product recyclable or your packaging recyclable, but at the same time, another approach is to use somebody else recycle material in your packaging. And we are exploring that, that, that second option because it allows us at the moment with the current technology to provide a solution, although we know that's not the 100% the solution that we want to get to one day. But until the technology catch up, catches up, I think that we are going to invest in, in what we can do. Um, it, it is a big concern. And um, I, I think that we will keep working on that until we find uh, breakthroughs that allow us to get where we want to be. Thank you. Uh, Gerardo, can you talk about uh, you know, the regulatory landscape, uh, you know, you know, what sort of regulations exist in, the, in your uh, industry and, you know, how you make sure that you're compliant with that and, you know, what are the uh, checks and balances you have to keep in, you know, check, uh, you know, in, in this industry? In, in the pet food industry, what in the, in the U.S., what everybody follows is the AFCO guidelines, which American uh, Feed Control Officials uh, Association, and they provide uh, a, a very useful set of guidelines in which not only you can tell what are the requirements for cats or for dogs at different life stages, because for puppy and dog are different and, and, and also for kitten and, and adult cat, but also allows you to say, give you really useful information on how to calculate the energy requirements, the any energy content of the product how to perform a digestibility trial to make sure that actually the nutrients are in the food, but also are absorbed by animal. And they also provide guidelines of how to um, describe the, the ingredients. In, in Europe, there is an equivalent. And when we make products for Europe, we, we have to follow a different uh, code, which is called FEDIAF. And is, is very equivalent. In some particular instances, uh, it's ironic, but the, the one nutrient requirement might be different for the US population than for the European population. And obviously, the French dogs have got the same sink requirement that the US dogs, but there you go, regulations are regulations. And, and that helps us, and, and not only us, but I would say the whole pet food industry uh, has bought into that. And, and I think that's a, a code of conduct that is very much needed because as, as we discussed before, when you provide food for cats and dogs, you have to make sure that they are complete and balanced and all those nutrients are there. Thank you. Um, how do you see sustainability you know, in, in the uh, pet food industry? Uh, so when I just say sustainability, you know, you may be seeing the, the food sustainability, uh, the sustainability of your, uh, uh, the producers who produce the foods or maybe the vendors that you deal with. How, how do you see that whole thing? Can you give us some sound bites on that? Um, sustainability is, is uh, something that I think that the, everybody's talking about it, but we, we need more action about it. And, and one of the things that we, we believe um, we can provide is with our process, we, we start with a chicken that is 65, 70% moisture and, and we don't modify that meat and, and we cook it um, and we put it for 10 minutes in, in, in a steam oven. And, and then we put it in the bag without having altered the moisture content of that chicken. So the dog or the cat will, will eat something that it has got the same moisture content than itself and it doesn't need to hydrate that food. The issue is when you feed dry pet foods because first you get the chicken and you convert that into a chicken meal and you dehydrate it by heating up. So that chicken that starts with 17% moisture, you convert it into a meal and you reduce it to 
10% moisture. So you evaporate all that water with the energy that, they, that, that, that is needed. And then you have the chicken meal and you combine it with carbohydrates, with grains, and you extrude it. So you hydrate it again. But then because you want that product to be stable and you want it to be stable by reducing the moisture content and reducing the water activity, you dehydrate that again. So it goes through another phase of dehydration. And when again, you go down to 10% moisture and you go through another cycle of evaporating water and, and basically using energy to evaporate the water. And then eventually you put it through this chain and, and it gets to the dog. And when the dog eats it, the dog will need to hydrate that and it need, will need to drink more water to convert it into 70% moisture because that's the body moisture of the dog. We find that actually uh, doesn't help the planet very much. And we prefer a process in which we, we don't remove the moisture of the ingredients yet so the dog uh, at the end has to hydrate it. Uh, we, we find that somehow wasteful. And I know that in the past, it has been a very efficient way to do things. Um, you don't need refrigeration. Um, it's easier to transport because it's lighter. So I am not going to say that it's all bad. There are advantages, but I think that we have to study uh, more those processes because although you might have a label of sustainability on the pack, the process in itself is not environmentally friendly. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, I think we were also um, having this podcast with another uh, industry leader in the in the food industry, and they were also, oh yeah, they were talking about the the tomatoes. Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm sorry, potatoes. They were talking about potatoes. You know how basically dehydrating them kind of makes it so convenient and easy for the uh, for the transportation, and you know how it can uh, you know save a lot of uh, carbon you know offset. How it can do uh, you know how the, the the product will become lighter and you know more shelf life. So uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and uh, I think that's one way to look at it. So uh, I think we are pretty much at the end, and I think there's one last question I just wanted to ask, and and then I just wanted to open it up. Uh, to you and you know anything you you wanted to talk about you know you want our listener to listeners to pay attention to or kind of you know take away from from this uh you know sort of like what what sort of impact you think is the is the the pet food industry is making you know as a whole and what are again i think we already talked about the challenges but what are some of the things that you're seeing and you know that has some future implications you know anything you just wanted to sum it up you know uh for 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 us well if you give me the chance to 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 share something else one of the things that i feel personal deep concern about is the fact that obviously i have i am a veterinarian and i have worked in the pet food industry all my life and and i am very proud of it but something i am not proud of is the fact that the pet population have an in, in incidence of obesity that is nearly 50%. If you look at how many obese pets, how many overweight pets we have, uh, it's, it's half of the pet population. And, and somehow, I, I don't know how we got there. I, I don't know how is, who is responsible, but I feel it is a shame because we do know that an obese pet is going to live half a shorter life and it's going to have higher incidence of, of diseases like osteoarthritis, maybe diabetes, um, you know, cardiac issues, lack of activity. All those things, I, I know I said before, giving food is giving love, but don't kill them with love. Feed them, oh, feed them to the right level and don't feed them products that are very rich in, in calorie content. And, and one of the, 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 the challenges is that all the dry pet foods can be very convenient in some cases. A, a cup of dry pet food has got as much energy content as, as a Mars bar. It's very energy dense. And, and when you eat something on, on food that is very energy dense, it's very easy to overeat. If, if you just eat cheese and chocolate, you are more likely to overeat and to end up with, with some extra weight than if you eat something that is fruit and salad. So I, I, I want to uh, make sure that it's not misunderstood that I, I tell people, hey, feed them 
with love um, because at the same time as a veterinarian, one of the things that I find, find more frustrating is the incidence of obesity. And, and I think that one of the cruelties of life is the fact that the lifespan of the pet is shorter than ours. And, and I, I, I had to suffer and anybody who had lost pets will, will, will remember how they felt when you lose a pet. And we would do anything to keep them longer for us and to keep them healthier. So please keep in mind that a, a pet is not happy because you feed it a lot. The pet is happy because it is with you and because you feed it, and but also because it goes for a walk with you and because it trains with you and because it, it has a relationship with you and spends time with you. Um, giving them a treat sometimes is the easiest way for us to continue working with a computer or looking on, on our phone. Um, but that's, that's, we have to try to fight that tendency and try to make sure that the pet is, is more uh, fulfilled by having more activity and, and, and more, uh, I would say, a healthier diet. That's right. So you, you believe uh, that the food is certainly one of the significant uh, factor of, you know, that that's leads to the obesity in the, in the pets, right? Well, the, the richer the food, the probably the more likely it is to, to, to end up with an obese pet. But at the same time, our pets, I mean, we, we feed them these bags that say, hey, call from the wild. But, to, but you can see the chihuahua is kind of walking from a bedroom into the sofa and back in an air conditioning or central heating environment is uh -huh. not hunting kibbles. Um, is is actually being kind of a very comfortable life. And, and it is a combination of, of the right food and, and the right lifestyle, which makes a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, so just one last thing, you know, it was interesting thing that you put out there and I just wanted to kind of, uh, on, a, on a very closing uh, remarks uh, about, you know, I know there are so many factors about, you know, the level of sodiums, the, the, the level of sugar content into it, and maybe like, you know, a lot of sugar-free stuff in the market, right, organic. So so you're saying that that, that is also one way, you know, the, the, the pet food industry can kind of innovate their, their products more so that, you know, the, these problems, the obesity and like many other problems that that can be addressed with some of these innovations. Yeah, obviously there, there are things you can do to make your diet less uh, energy dense. Uh, you, you Maintaining high moisture is one of those things that help to re maintain the calorie content low and at the same time to provide some satiety to the dog. So when, when you eat something that is fulfilling, you are not looking for something else to, to, to uh, kind of eat in after 40 minutes. You, you are basically content and, and you are going to wait until your dinner time. So th there are things we can do to the diets to, to make them more satisfying for the pets. But at the same time, if you keep continuing offering a treat to the, to the dog, um, just because the dog is seeking attention, uh, you are providing a reward to the dog and the dog will eat it because it's coming from you. But you, you might want to think, hey, maybe the dog just wants a pet or, or yes, uh, go for a walk or a, for me to tickle his tummy, um, don't just throw the treat as, as, as the first, first option. Interesting, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I think, yeah, you know, we kind of overdo his love sometimes just to kind of, you know, keep getting, get on to the things that we are doing. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly we need to be more aware of that, but that's, that's a very good, uh, interesting discussions. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I hope that, you know, our viewers are really going to leverage a lot from it. They're going to really find this interesting. And um, with that, I think uh, we covered pretty much everything. Any, any last uh, closing remarks you wanted to point out there, Gerardo? Or... Um, no, I just want to thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and to the listeners. Um, we, as, as you can tell, I feel very passionate about this, but the, I think it's passion that makes the, the world go around. And I think that the, the pet food industry is, um, it has an exciting time. Many people are getting new pets 
and and pets are uh, part of the family and they are loved, and so they should be because they they don't hold back when it comes to get get back that love we give them. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time again, and uh, we'll hopefully touch base again. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcast. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 